Um, let me start by talking about software as a service because that's, people often confuse the notions of software as a service with the notions of microservices. Um, the, the SOS model is one that has been around for a long time, but it is not micro in any sense of the word. That's the main difference, is most of the SOS applications were just big, giant applications. They tended to have REST front ends. They tended to be hosted on a single web server. Um, they tended to be, um, well, monolithic is the word that I've used here, but uh, monolithic in the sense that they were just one big application. So from an architectural point of view, software as a service is not a particularly interesting model. It's just a big app that's got a REST front end in front of it running on a web server. Microservices are nothing like that. Um, the, oh, the other one, the last one I'll put in there is they tend to access the data only. I'll come back to that in a second. But if you think about it, they're RESTful. And if you're doing REST, that means that you've got four verbs, and you're using those four verbs to access resources. Right? Well, what you end up with then is that your software as a service model, more often than not, turned into nothing but a front end in front of the database. And a microservice is not doing that. Microservices are actually doing work. So the microservices, on the other hand, are very small. Um, the, they, um, by very small, I mean they could be anything in the range of a few lines of code to maybe a few thousand lines of code, but they're not going to be an entire application. Um, I'll get into this more in a moment, but if you think about object modeling, about breaking up a program into a set of objects that implement some well-defined class, with the objects talking to each other using messaging, right? We've all heard that word, using messaging. The problem is, is that we've come to interpret that word, using messaging, as mean, meaning making function calls, right? A microservice architecture is really nothing but that, except we're actually using real messaging. So if you think of a microservice as being a class, that's actually a better way to think of it than thinking of it as an application that's running on a, on a server somewhere, on a computer somewhere. It's really a standalone class. And as we'll see in a minute, you, de you design them the same way you would design standalone classes. So they're small, they're self-contained, they hide things, right? One of the characteristics of an object that's an extremely important object is that an object, if it's done right, will hide the implementation details. Um, I have a rule of thumb that you should be able to completely replace the implementation of an object with a different implementation, and the clients of that object shouldn't know. That, that rule applies in spades to microservices. So microservices will typically have their own databases, but more importantly, they will not expose any information about how they're accessing that database to the outside world. They tend to not, in other words, provide data. Now, they will provide some data, is that these are web applications we're building, so you need to move data down to the web, to the browser in order to be able to, to um, do anything, in order to, to expose a user interface. But more often than not, you'll follow this another basic object-oriented rule, which is that you don't ask for information, you ask for help is that you don't ask for the data that you need to do work, you ask the thing that has the data to do the work for you. And that's really at the core of the microservice model. This notion of having a remote entity that does work for us, rather than provide us with data that we need to do the work. So because of that, that tends to reduce the size of the client side piece, because it's not doing as much work as it used to be doing, and that's a good thing, of course, is that means that the client side piece can focus on the user interface rather than on the underlying logic. Now, Conway's law keeps coming up in the context of the microservices, and I think it's worth thinking about. The basic notion, of, again, of Conway's law, which you've probably heard six times by now, is the correlation between the structure of the organization and the structure of the software that the organization produces. And a lot of that has to do with organizing things into silos within inside the organization. In other words, when you have a silo-like organization, you end up with a silo-like application. So uh, the whole notion of a three-tiered or n-tiered architecture is really dependent, or not dependent, but connected to the way that the organization is put together. Now, when we go into the agile world, we go into multifunctional teams, where we have three teams that, represent, that have represented upon them all of the skills that one needs to do the application. So given that kind of organization, that gives us a lot more flexibility in terms of how we build things, is that you end up now with small microservices that are self-contained. The team could build a single microservice without talking to anybody else. 
Now, it's not always the case, in fact, it's not often the case that you'll have a direct team to microservice relationship, right? This team is responsible for this service. Because in an agile world, at least, the unit of work is a story, not a piece of technology. So in the process of implementing a story, you're going to have to go in and tweak three or four little microservices. But the point is, is that because of this team structure, that's not only possible, it's easy. So one of the reasons I want to bring, I want to bring this up for two reasons, is that one is that this Microsoft model then, or Microsoft, this microservice model becomes a very um, distributed kind of model where each of the services is very well, is very self-contained, but more to the point, it contains all of the functionality that can be implemented by the people that are building it. So notice that each one of these microservices has its own database. There won't be a big, giant, monolithic database in a microservice system. Is that every object is responsible for maintaining its own state. It gets back to the whole basic notions of object-oriented design. So from my, from as far as I'm concerned, the difference between an object and a microservice is just a mechanical one of how do you send the messages. It's got nothing to do with, the, with differences in design particularly. So, that gets us again to another basic OO concept, that the objects are defined by what they do, not by how they do it. So from a design point of view, you've got to be thinking in terms of designing that way. Those of you who are in my class on Monday, um, this is one of the main things that I teach to people when I come into a company as a consultant for a day of training, is I teach people how to start with a story and then end up with an architecture that directly reflects the abstractions in that story. And that's a, that's a very important thing to learn, is that there should be a direct correlation between the system that you're building and the objects that appear in your stories. So for example, if at the domain level, you have objects like customers and orders and line items, inside the program there will be classes like customers and orders and line items. There will be a one-to-one -one correlation between the classes in your system and the main abstractions, if you will, at the domain level. From an Agile point of view, that's essential because the changes happen at the domain level. And if there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the domain and the code, when a change happens in the domain, it's very easy to see exactly what you need to modify in the code in order to make that change real. If there's some system that has no direct co connection to the UI, for example, or no direct connection to, the, to any other part of the system, and there's an elaborate mapping, making those domain level changes becomes very, very difficult. Now, microservices follow the same kind of philosophy, is that you have to be mapping the individual services to domain level objects. So if you're doing an order processing system, odds are you're going to have an order service, and uh, perhaps even a line item service, an individual object service. You'll certainly have a customer service. You'll have an authentication service, right? So it's going to map to the domain. The services are going to map to the domain. Is everyone following what I'm saying here? So if you're thinking in terms of the service mapping to a specific piece of technology, as in the case of, uh, often I'll see people who do it wrong have a database access service. That's fundamentally incorrect. Is that you want to have domain level services that use whatever mechanism they need to use in order to do whatever they do. If that involves talking to a database, fine. If it doesn't involve talking to a database, fine. Right, now one of the things that we'll see in a moment, we will certainly get to it, is that in the little blogging system that I've put together, I don't even use a database. It wasn't worth it. In other words, I'm doing a blogging system for myself to use on my own website. And my main goal was to have articles and comments attached to those articles. That's what I was trying to do. And I thought about that for a moment, and I thought, I'm going to produce, at best, two articles a month. So every year, I'm going to churn out a grand total of 24 articles. It is not worth messing around with a database to store 24 articles, believe me. I would much rather have 24 files sitting in, a, in the file system someplace. And by the same token, every article might have attached to it a dozen comments. It's not worth putting those in a database. Instead, I will just stick them in a file in JSON format. Right now, if I was going to scale the system up so that it was handling a massive number of blogs with a massive number of comments in it, well, I'm storing everything in JSON anyway, so I can just replace the file system with MongoDB and I'm up and running on a, with a real database. But I'm not going to do that first. 
because there's no need to do that first. There's this agile philosophy that you implement in the simplest way possible for the situation at hand. But you want to implement in such a way that you can expand it. Now, I followed that last rule by implementing around JSON, because that way I can do my flat file to Mongo translation in a few minutes <laughs> as compared to a few days or a few weeks of work. But the point is, is that the microservice architecture allows me to do that because nobody knows how a given service is storing the data or cares. So as a consequence, I can store the data any way that's convenient to me. If it's convenient to put it on the file system, I'll do that. If it starts being less convenient to do that, I'll change it to something else. Nobody will notice that that change has happened. Is everyone with me here? If you have a database access service, you don't have this luxury because there's, a lot of, there's going to be a lot of information in the APIs to that service that are making assumptions about the fact that there even is an underlying database and the way that database works. The other issue is transactional. We'll get back to transactions in a second also, but if I have an order object or if I have a blog object or if I have a comment object, any modification to that is going to be atomic with respect to the outside world. Add this comment. If, on the other hand, I have a database service, Getting atomicity there, but turning things into transactions, becomes very, very difficult, especially in a kind of flaky network kind of world where you have to be guaranteeing that all of the pieces of the transaction actually succeed before you will commit the transaction. If, on the other hand, I just say to a, to a comment manager, add this comment, I know that's atomic, even if it has to be done in multiple steps to the underlying database. So the notion of transactions helped, or helped a lot by working with this basic principle is that you're defining things by what it does, by, by being a, a domain level object, not, a, not a, um, a technology or a piece of technology focused object. So when it comes to data then, you're just not thinking about it. Data is a non-issue. Database design is not a significant part of this process. There's nothing for a company-wide DBA to do here. So, which gets us back to Conway's law, right, is that not only does the structure of the system reflect the structure of the organization, when you change the architecture of the systems that you're working on in significant ways, the structure of the organization has to change to adopt to that system's architecture. It goes both ways. So architectural changes of this magnitude are significant from an organizational point of view is that all of a sudden the central DBA or the office of the central DBA, if there is such a thing, is not going to have anything to do, is they're going to have to distribute knowledge out to the individual teams because it's the individual teams that are going to be doing the data access now, not, not the company as a whole. On the other hand, that makes our work a lot easier because I can mess around with my services little chunk of database and I just don't care about any of the other groups in the organization because they might not even be using the same database that I am but there's no big monolithic database that somehow has to be managed across the whole enterprise in this kind of world. And from my point of view, that's a huge plus. So again, the rule that, I was, that, I, that came out a moment ago, asking the object to do the work for you, as we call this delegation in the object-oriented world. But in the microservice world, it's essential, is that uh, both from a transactional point of view and also from a, from a um, just getting work done point of view. Now, REST is the other thing that comes up in the context of microservices. And like data, you don't want to be doing REST either. And that's not to say that you don't want to be using HTTP. Is that I'm fine with HTTP as a transport layer. But REST is a very specific thing. REST doesn't just mean you make a request across HTTP. What REST means is that your requests use verbs that are defined in the HTTP standard. Get, put, post the basic CRUD operations. And if you're doing REST properly, the way REST should work is that the URL should specify a resource and the verb, in other words, is it a post, is it a get, controls what you do with that resource. So REST is all about resource access. It's all about data, really. And we just saw that data is not really a central part of what a microservice is, that you're hiding the data. So a pure REST interface is of no value to us. And uh, so building a microservice across a REST framework, all you're doing is adding complexity to your system that you don't need. Everything's a post. So if everything is a post, then you don't have to obviously put support for get <laughs> into your application as you're just wasting time adding it. So again, as I said, HTTP is useful. 
but rest is not particularly. It's not, not uh, the official rest kind of way of looking at things. Now, having said that, I do not use HTTP for microservices to communicate with each other. I'll, I'll, I use messaging for that, and we'll get to that in a moment. So even, even in, the, in the HTTP level, at the HTTP level, we don't want to be using it unnecessarily. It's a, level, it's a level of complexity that we would like to avoid. As an Agile guy, I want to do things as simply as possible. All right? Now, microservices all have to have certain characteristics also, so let's talk about those. In other words, one of the things that I think of as damaging when it comes to talking about REST applications is that people tend to think of a microservice as if it's a servlet or whatever unit of, of, of HTTP handling you want to do. They tend to think of it as a little blob of functionality that's running inside the web server. And that's not nearly good enough. So this notion of thinking that a microservice is something that I can just build as a, if you were in Java, you would build it as an applet, for example. If you're in the Microsoft world, you'd build it as one small service that was installed into IIS. That's not a microservice. That's just a REST handler. Microservice has to, have, to be functional, have a whole set of characteristics that are important to maintain, and the first one is security. Is that simply making a REST call to a remote server is not secure. SSL does not give you security. Right? We want to make sure that nobody can call our service that is not, who is not authorized to call our service. That's the, you can't do that, at least at the transport layer in HTTP. You have to use some kind of token system. In other words, if you log on, you get a token that, that the system generates, a single use token that the system generates for this session. And that token has to be passed back as part of every microservice call. Because that's the only way the microservice can verify that you are approved to use the service. You can't let just anybody come in and use the service because they will bring your site down in a heartbeat if you allow that. In other words, a denial of service attack against a microservice where all that you do is just start making massive numbers of service calls without throwing the results away, that's way easy to do. So we have to protect ourselves against that at some level, and the easiest way to do it is with a token. So you can at least say at the very beginning of the processing, this token is not valid, so I'm going to reject this call. And if you're really going to take security seriously, you have to do this at every level. You can't just check the token when the REST call comes in and then imagine that you don't need to look at it again because there are going to be lots of hacks that are going to, that are going to go deeper into the data center than that, that are going to go deeper, deeply past the, the actual REST handler. So you have to be checking these tokens at every level, at every service level. So everyone following what I'm saying here? So the, this is a non, the security side is, it's actually, I say it's non-trivial, but it actually is trivial in some ways. It's easy to do. You have to have some authentication service that's generating a token as a side effect of li login. You have to verify that whoever's making the request is legitimate. If you look at Amazon services or Google services, for example, they will issue you as a programmer a unique password, effectively, right, a long string of random junk that you have to pass back to them every time you open up a connection to their service. But one way or another, you've got to do that, and you, which is not hard, but you have to do it everywhere, which is, is that people don't want to do it everywhere. They don't want to look at it. They don't want to have a token passed in as the first argument of every method on their microservice. But get in the habit of doing that. You really need to. So security, then, is the first issue. It has to be, let's see, what have I put here? I've, hopefully, I've talked about everything that's on the slide. Secure tokens. End-to-end -end encryption I haven't talked about, and that's important also. If data is sensitive, it's sensitive. Um, when people think about uh, security, they often think about the peri periphery of the system, as if you can build a big wall around your application, and every, if you're inside that wall, everything's safe, and if you're outside that wall, everything's dangerous, and all of the security is focused on getting through the gate. That never works. That never works. So if you're going to be secure, you've got to be secure through the whole system because you never want to be in a situation where somebody, acts, somebody hacks into one corner and then can leverage the fact that they're now in to start 
touching things that are elsewhere in the system. Now, if it's a heavily messaged system, if they've, if they've hacked into one service, they probably have access to your message bus, in which case, at minimum, they can monitor what's going across the message bus. So everything, if it's going to be secure, has to be secure. So something like a credit card number, you can't turn it into plain text when it hits the data center. You have to keep it encrypted all the way through to the database, all the way through to the place where you're going to store it. You need end-to-end -end encryption. Well, 0MQ has a really nice end-to-end -end encryption system in it that is, um, it does elliptic curve cryptography from the point where the message is sent to the point where the message is received. And that's really valuable. That's a valuable feature to have in your communication system, and it's one that all communications for microservices should use. So if you're using a messaging layer that's not doing that kind of encryption for you, then you have to add one. Right, zero is nice in that it provides one, but there are many, many messaging imp message bus implementations in, in the world. It has to be autonomous. So first of all, it should be a standalone process. And this is another change in thinking that's mandatory here. A lot of people, when they think message uh, microservices are again, they're thinking REST. So they're thinking in something that plugs into my web server. Well, if you're implementing your microservices as six plugins to your web server, then it's not actually autonomous anymore. You're dependent on the web server. You're dependent on a lot of things. Now, my microservices are standalone processes. I launch them from the command line. Or if I want to be fancy, I launch them from a script from the, that's run when I start up the system. But there's no, I don't use web servers. <laughs> for the microservice system. I'll look about what I do use in a moment to do the HTTP part. But the individual services should be individual processes. So if they crash, it's not a big deal. You just launch it again. If you crash, Apache, if you crash uh, um, the Apache web server, that is a big deal. Because all of a sudden, the entire site goes down. If a, if a single web service, if a single microservice crashes, well, you either launch it again or there might be three or four of them running and it won't impact anything. You just notice that it's crashed, log that fact so you can go fix it, and then launch it again. So the services have to be autonomous at every level. They have to be autonomous at the level of you don't know what's happening in, on the other side of the API. They're autonomous at the level of the, they use their own database. And they're autonomous at the level of execution, actually at the runtime execution level. So the service should be implemented as a standalone process if it can be. Um, underlying data is not shared. I think I've said that enough. Being able to launch, to be able to be launched independently of the rest of the system, again, that's an extremely important characteristic from a scalability perspective. If you think, the other side of this that I haven't discussed is that if you think about cloud-based cloud hosting, which a lot of us are moving towards, um, the way the cloud-based hosting works is that if the system is being too loaded, you have some mechanical monitor that observes that and launches a new instance of a virtual machine to compensate for the load. And the virtual machine has to be able to launch any services that are on that virtual machine automatically as a side effect of booting, which is easy enough to do, right? It's just a script. But the, the issue here, though, is, the issue here, though, is that um, they have to be launched independently in the sense that the whole launch process has to be automatable. And again, if you're putting things inside an existing web server, that's much harder. It's doable, of course, but it's much harder. You mean they should be launched independently of each other or just independently of everything? Independently of everything. So independently of each other and independently of a container, all of these things. You should be able to bring your surfaces up in any order, and they shouldn't care. So there should never be dependencies in the sense of this service has to be running before I can be launched. And the services have to be independent in the sense of, of they're not connected together through a web container of some sort, for example, also. So at both levels. Okay? Deploying them independently is also important, is that you want to be able to um, Add new services to the system dynamically while the system is running. You never want to have to bring your server down. Or your server. By server now, I'm meaning this big cloud of services that are operating on one or more machines. 
right? Well, if we do things by messaging, that's easy to do. You can bring a new service up just by launching it. And you can take a service down by launching it. And if you upgrade a service, you launch the new version, so then I have two versions running in parallel. If the new version works, then you shut down the old version and there's been zero downtime. But again, to pull this off, you have to have complete autonomy. Right? The service has to really be a standalone thing that you can launch that can run in parallel with the old version without any kind of conflict. Okay? It has to be reliable, which means that um, you have to be able to expect it to be there. <laughs> so once it's there, it's gotta, it has to do things to make sure that it stays there. <laughs> the side effect of this is that services often, they'll either have to support ping or they'll have to support a heartbeat. Right? And by, by a ping, what I mean is that you have to be able to ask the service, are you alive, and get a response back. By a heartbeat, I mean, Five times a second, the service publishes a notification saying, I'm alive. And some other monitor, some other service, can subscribe to that topic in order to see who's alive and who's not. So if it notices that something is not alive, it can relaunch it. So that's how you get reliability. Right? And you can take, the, to imagine that our services are not going to crash, we're living in a fantasy land if we imagine that. Right? They are going to crash occasionally. <coughs> So we need to write the system with that in mind. We have to assume that it's going to fail, and we need to be able to write our systems so that when they do fail, they can gracefully recover from that failure. Notification I just talked about. Logging. Logging is also a very important part of this whole thing. Logging and monitoring. Right? So the way most monitoring systems work is by looking at logs which means that if you don't have logs, you can't monitor, <laughs> right? Ideally, you want monitoring to happen from outside rather than inside. In other words, it's very difficult to add monitoring inside the service. And sometimes you don't need to. If you just monitor the message bus, for example, that's often sufficient. But you do want to be logging rather heavily and efficiently. Messaging, as it turns out, is a good way to do logging also. But um, a lot of times when people are working in visual development environments, they tend to not think about logging. Right? If we were all running Unix circa, I don't know, 1980, <laughs> right? With the debuggers that we would have would be the world's most miserable debuggers. They'd all be these command line things. And uh, uh, as a consequence, we would not spend much time in them because they would not be very efficient ways to work. And the way we would verify that our program is working is with a, with a hugely verbose logging stream. <laughs> right? Anytime the program did anything, it would log stuff. Well, we have to get back to thinking in those terms, in terms of making our systems monitorable. We want to log a bunch of stuff. We don't want to make it too verbose. Now, admittedly, no human being is going to be looking at these log files. But if the log files grow too quickly, that's kind of a problem. We run out of disk space too quickly. And if the log files are too big, it loads down our messaging infrastructure, and we don't want to have that happen. But we want to at least register where we are in the program so that when the system crashes, we know what we were doing when the system crashed. So generally speaking, it's important to be able to identify when things go wrong and log that at least. In other words, you should be checking the return values from anything that can return an error return. And if you get an error return, you should be logging that fact. Now, that doesn't mean you should be stopping functioning at that point. You should then try and carry on. <laughs> but you should at least log the fact that something is screwy here. Was that a, you're just stretching. <laughs> um, next characteristic. Oops, why did it go? I'm hitting the wrong button. That's why I went backwards. I'm getting there. Oh, come on. <laughs> You would, you would think that the people that put together like PowerPoint and Keynote and all these systems would figure out that people hit the wrong button occasionally and you, <laughs> you need to go forward. You need, a, you need to undo the last button click call. There it is, finally. <laughs> hmm? Minimal value proposition. I guess it is, yeah. <laughs> High value for me though, right? I'm the customer. So I should. <laughs> um, scalability. 
you need to be able to have multiple instances running at the same time. It's the way you, do scale, the way you scale microservice systems is you spawn off new instances of the service when the existing, service, the existing instance is overloaded. So to make something scalable, it's gotta, it has to be possible for multiple instances of the service to run concurrently. Um, it doesn't require any kind of external load balancing, which is a good thing, is that you can do the vast majority of your load balancing at the software level. You can do it inside your messaging infrastructure. So all of the hassle of maintaining hardware load balancing, you don't need any hardware load balancing until the system gets massively large. Um, and now again, that's a function of the messaging infrastructure that you're using is one of the things I like about Zero MQ is that it is, is extremely lightweight. It can handle a huge volume before it, the server starts breaking down. So you don't need to be uh, doing a lot of hardware load balancing because the very front end, the very you know, the point at which the you start spawning off requests is so fast and so efficient that it can handle a vast quantity of requests before it starts bogging down. So that's a good thing. Um, multiple instances have to be able to run on multiple machi machines, but you also have to be able to run them on the same machine. And that should be completely painless. That should be a matter of changing an IP address in a configuration file somewhere. Um, <clears throat> lightweight and fast, I think that goes without saying. They have to be concurrent um, in the sense, of course, that multiple instances can run in parallel no matter what environment they're in, even if they're running in the same process. Now, one of the things, though, that's interesting about a microservice architecture is that if you use that same architecture in process, you use it as, as a way of organizing things inside the process. In other words, where you have two I, I don't know what would be smaller than micro, let's call them PICO services, <laughs> running inside our process. And those two PICO services are talking to each other with a, across a message bus inside our process. Suddenly concurrency becomes much easier to implement than it used to be. If microservices are implemented properly, all of the concurrency control that you need can be done on the message bus, can be done just by getting things on and off the message bus in a synchronous way. And you don't have to use any semaphores or flags or any of the, the uh, thread control stuff that all of us beat our heads against all the time. All of that can just go away. It vastly simplifies our lives. So we're solving threading here with an architectural approach rather than using a programming approach for solving the, con the concurrency problem. And that's a good thing. So you want to be using a messaging system, Rabbit and, and, and Zero both do this, that have that use in mind that have built things so that they can be work, so that they work concurrently and painlessly. Um, you don't want to use sessions, at least not server-side sessions, because that gets in the way of a lot of the stuff that we're talking about here. Get, first of all, it gets in the way of concurrency, is that if, you, are, if there, you have to make two or three method calls in order to get some operation done, those three method calls might be on three different services. If you've got state stored somewhere, all of a sudden things get very complicated. So in microservice web applicate, microservice based web applications, if you need to store state, you tend to store it on the client. You tend to use cookies or something like that to store it on the client. So the, there isn't any server side session and what you do is replace it with client side session. Um, no sticky routing, right? Is that there's a, one of the things that you can do when you use hardware load balancing is you can say when the second request comes in, send it to the same machine that the first request came in. That's a huge problem. From a maintenance point of view, that's a huge problem. So you don't want to assume that there's sticky routing inside the system. Um, behavior should not vary, vary with state because, again, the th two or three method calls that comprise an operation might happen on two or three different microservices. So if the service itself is stateful, you're in deep trouble. <laughs> right? If the first call put it into some state and the second call assumes that state, well, if the second call goes to a different microservice, it's going to be in the wrong state if the service is stateful. So information about what state you should be in has to be carried along with the request. And the service has to put itself in that state based on the information that's carried along with the request. Which means that our API design gets really tricky in situations where we have to have stateful behavior. Fault tolerant. It has to be possible for these things to come on and offline without any problems. 
right, is that the, I've talked a lot about that so far, but you get the idea, right, is that if the thing should be able to crash and be rebooted without, without causing any difficulties in the overall system. Um, what that means is you should never throw an exception out of a service. Inside the service is fine, but you should never throw an exception out of a service. If an exception that you can't handle is thrown inside the program as part of a service request, the service request should fail gracefully. It shouldn't throw an exception. Does everyone understanding what I'm saying here? In other words, every service has to, associate, has to have associated with it a state, that, a return state, that means I just couldn't do it. I don't know why, but it just didn't work. A question about that. So if you do say asynchronous commands, mm -hmm. how can you get that failure message back? Well, it's asynchronous in the sense that a request can come in at any time and the reply will come in at some time in the future after you make the request. And so there's always a reply coming back onto the bus. So if there was an exception thrown inside the service that you could just not handle, something that made it all the way back up to Maine, you'd have to register the fact that there was work in progress, catch the exception, and then have the exception handler send a failure back out onto the message bus. Right, now I'll look at the messaging architecture in a moment, I think, yes I will. And the, the, um, the request and the reply are always separate messages for that reason. Right, does everyone hear what I'm saying? You don't, you don't make a request and do a reply as a side effect of having received the request. You make a, a request as a standalone operation. And sometime later, you will publish a reply that some subscriber then will, will pay attention to. So what that means is that it is possible to keep around a list of ongoing requests. And then when the server reboots, <laughs> the first thing it does is look at that list and sends out failures to everybody that's, that's ongoing, just by publishing them. Right? So it's, a, it's, a, um, it's an interesting problem, but it's certainly a, a, a solvable problem. With that request requirement, sorry, mm -hmm. request requirement model, if you've got scalability, say you've got a reply maybe picked up by one of several servers, mm -hmm. several microservices, mm -hmm. Um, if, the, if you have multiple instances of, the, of a service, they may, may be sharing a database. It might be necessary. Ideally, you don't want that to happen, but it's, you can't avoid it in some situations. I'm just thinking if you've got a re request reply message, then really the person that made the service that made the request wants to get the reply. Required. Well, it has to be transactional, right? So if that exception is thrown, you better undo anything you've done to the database. Right? The, the way that I implement these applications is I don't actually touch the database in the process of running the application, running the, the request. In other words, what the request does is that it creates an object from the database. And then in the process of running the request, I modify that object. And then the very last thing I do, right before I send out the reply, is I update the database from that object. So if an exception is thrown, the database is not touched. Right, because I'll just skip over that very last step. Um, if you're using WCF, it actually does that for you, which is a kind of nice thing. So the, the, um, that makes the object transactional in a sense, in the sense of it's all, all, everything or nothing. <laughs> okay? Is, is everyone following what I'm saying here? So you need to do that in a shared database situation, otherwise the database can get corrupted too easily. if you're monitoring if your service is up or not, if you find that it's not up, the, um, uh, the kind of source of, you know, the requester of that service, mm -hmm. obviously, because you've got the message bus in place, you could just continue to put messages on them when the service That's what you do. That's exactly what you do. Aren't you at risk of taking your message bus down there? Because if it never came at you... Not if it's a decently it. implemented message bus. Okay. <laughs> neither, <laughs> zero or ra neither zero nor rabbit will have a problem with that scenario. Right, they just have to be able to store a large volume of messages until it comes back up. But by the same token, that means your heartbeat should be fast enough that you can get the thing up and running again before, the, before you run out of queue, space in your queues. Right, but it, even the simplest message buses will reject and queue requests if the queue is full. And which means that you just request, you, you take that a step further back and issue a 500 status if it was an HTTP request coming in. <clears throat> transactional, we've been talking about a lot of the transaction stuff, right? The basic idea, though, is that... <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, so, quickly back to fault tolerance and also reliability. Um, when you were talking about reliability, 
reliability, you had said um, when you receive an error, uh -huh. you log in and you attempt to handle it and continue. And with fault tolerance, um, these points kind of allude to, but they don't actually say anything about failing fast. So my question is, is the choice to fail fast versus attempt to handle and continue about internal errors to a given service instance versus cross service instance communications? Or I, no, I, you're failing fast, always. So I think that's an important rule. But you can't always fail fast. Am I making sense? In other words, the, the cause, maybe I'm not understanding the question, but the cause of the failure might be known or unknown. If it's known, then you can fail fast. If it's unknown, then you have to fall back to these kinds of exception catching strategies where you fail at the end of the process. And the, the, it's hard to predict every way in which a service can fail. At least it is for me. I, maybe I'm not answering your question. I mean, well, Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so I was saying that as compared to when you had said you receive an error, uh -huh. talking about reliability, you handle it and you attempt to continue. Right. So I was wondering how you um, would look at those guys. Attempting to continue. Right. The, the, the real issue is state. In other words, can you trust the service to be in a viable state if there was an exception thrown? And that's a question that I can't answer without looking at the code. Right? Does everyone understand the problem, though? Right? In other words, if you have a random exception that's come out of nowhere and you're catching it in main, what state is the program in at that point? And it's hard to determine sometimes. And if you can't determine it, the only safe thing to do at that point is to bring the program down and launch, launch it from scratch. Because right? the, 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 um, you, you don't know what state it's in. Now, of course, if we do things, like, if we do things that we should be doing anyway, minimizing the use of singletons, not using global variables at all, and so on and so forth, then it's much easier to write a stateless service in the sense that no matter how an exception gets tossed, there is no global state to worry about, so we can just keep going. But that's not always possible. So if that's not possible, then the only choice we have, really, is to bring down the service and relaunch it. Is that everyone with me here? Now, if you're doing things right, you don't actually do that. What you do is relaunch it and then bring it down. <laughs> right? Is you launch a new instance first and then you bring down the old one. Because that way you don't have any off time. You don't have any downtime. But it's, um, it, it, this, it's a programming issue is that there's no pat answer. Is that obviously if you cannot bring the service down, you're in better shape than if you have to. But if you have to, you have to. So, but it, from a programming point of view, we want to try and be thinking about that as we're putting the service together. We want to try and think about whether the server on which the service is running is stateful or if the service itself is stateful. And, can that, and, and what do we do if we get an exception and we don't know how to handle it? So everyone following what I'm saying here? It's an important issue. Um, your unit of transaction in the service should be a single method call. In other words, it shouldn't be that you make two or three or four methods. Now, if you get back to the OO design stuff I was talking about a moment ago, that's almost a side effect of designing properly. In other words, if you're asking the object that has the work, or the information rather, to do the work for you, the requests tend to be for a complete unit of work. So you don't have a situation where you have to make three requests in order to get a single unit of work done. You're not getting and getting and getting and then setting and then setting and then setting. You're just saying, do this for me. So at that point, the call becomes transactional from a design point of view in the sense that one call equals one transaction. And you want to do that as much as possible. So getters and setters are not a great idea in this kind of, this kind of environment. They're not a great idea in any kind of environment, but they're particularly not a great idea in this kind of environment. Um, operations work completely or not at all, as that's what I was just discussing, really, w in the context of exception handling. Right? In other words, if, it, if, it, if, it, if anything goes wrong, it has to fail in a way that has not changed the state of the world. I think I just said that. All right, now let's move into stuff that can be a little bit more controversial, depending on who you're talking to, is platform neutrality. 
Um, uh, most of us in this room, I imagine, are working in the Microsoft world because everybody in London is working in the Microsoft world. <laughs> um, I go back home. I live in the San Francisco area. Nobody's working in the Microsoft world. I don't know of a single Microsoft project. Not one. Nobody's using .NET. Nobody's programming in C Sharp. A lot of people are programming in Ruby. They're programming in Python. They're programming in various JVM languages like Scala, sometimes even Java, the less and less so. Um, the, the world is a different world. <laughs> so the problem is, is that if you have a microservice architecture that you want to combine <laughs> with other external systems, or if you want to be able to outsource some of the work to somebody else who's working elsewhere, or if you just want to implement in the language that's most appropriate. If you have something that is heavily text processing based, implementing that in C Sharp is a kind of madness. Because I could do the same thing in Python in one one hundredth of the time. Right? Because Python is a language that's designed to manipulate strings. That's what it does. So I don't want to be forced to do a whole bunch of Python style string manipulation in C Sharp or in Java just because somebody has decided that Java is the best language since peanut butter. You know, is that the, the, we just don't want to be doing that. Is we want to be able to choose the right tool for the job. Now, because we're working in microservices, and because all of our communication is going to happen across the network on a, on a service bus, on, a, on a, a messaging bus, then we don't need to write the services in the same language. So by making something platform neutral then, it doesn't really, we don't care anymore what platform things are running on. Some of it can be running on .NET, some of it could be running on a different platform entirely, and it shouldn't matter. Right? Some of our services could be .NET services, some of them could be uh, running on Linux, and it just doesn't matter. Now, ideally, you'd like it to be deployed easily to any platform, and this is where things start getting controversial. Right? Because if you start writing in some environments, you're not going to be able to deploy on some platforms if you make certain assumptions. Microsoft, fortunately, has been getting much more willing to support open source stuff than they used to be. So nowadays you can deploy a lot of stuff onto the IIS and onto the Microsoft, into the Microsoft infrastructure that you didn't used to be able to deploy. <coughs> the other direction is harder. Deploying a .NET application onto a Linux box is not easy. It's doable, but it's not easy. So you want to be thinking about that. You want to be thinking about implementing in technologies that can be deployed in a platform neutral way, if at all possible. Um, you don't want to leverage plat plat platform specific behavior inside the, inside the services. So if there's something that only .NET does and nobody else, maybe you shouldn't use it. I hate to say that because it kind of drives us to a least common denominator kind of situation. But from my point of view, the flexibility of being able to deploy on other platforms if necessary is more important than the annoyance of having to not use a feature that, that I can't use on the other platform. Um, Platform-specific protocols, and I put SOAP into that list, you should be avoiding them. Because believe me, if you have a microservice with an HTTP-based front end, and you try and use SOAP there, nobody in the San Francisco Bay Area will ever use your service. It won't happen. SOAP is a thing that is, SOAP has become a Microsoft thing. Nobody else on the planet is using it. It's too complicated. It's too big. There's way too much overhead. The SOAP envelope is just way too big, given what's happening inside that SOAP envelope. The things that the SOAP envelope does for you, like uh, type safety, shouldn't matter in a service. I'll come back to that in a second, but that shouldn't matter. So you don't want to be using that stuff. Now, that's a problem, right? Because if you're in the Microsoft world, again, it's going to tend to drive you towards SOAP if you're going to leverage their Tools, WCF, for example, you can't really escape SOAP if you're going to use WCF to implement services. But you really don't want to be using SOAP because that locks you down. It ties you down. It means that I can't talk to things that don't understand SOAP or won't, won't understand SOAP. Is everyone understanding what I'm trying to get at here? So you want to keep things flexible. You want to make them, you, the service, the application is running on multiple machines, running different operating systems, with the services running in different languages. And you want to be able to handle that kind of polyglot, multinational, if you will, kind of, kind of arrangement because you want to tune the service. You want to tune the environment to the service. If it's a text-based thing, you tune the service by writing it in Python. 
Does everyone see what I'm getting at here? It might be better for, for some servers to be running under Linux than .NET. You want to be able to do that. You want the option. You want to support standard communication protocols, obviously. That's easy because most of us are happy to use TCP. But the, the, um, you, want to be do, you want to do it, obviously. Now, leniency is the next side of this. Um, if the services can be written in any language, you have to be able to deal with that. And lots of languages have lots of differences with each other. The way in which numbers are represented varies from language to language and also from platform to platform. So this is kind of an extension of the platform independence issue, is that the data as it flows through the system has to be independent of both the language and the platform, which means that it is almost always ASCII and JSON. Right, because a number in JSON is a number. <laughs> right, is that we don't care whether it's big endian or little endian or, we don't really even care about the precision. Now the service has to be lenient in the sense that if it gets a number in a JSON statement, it's got to be able to deal with that number. So if it's a 16-bit int and the number won't fit into a 16-bit int, your service better deal with that. Not just reject it, but deal with it. Because we're trying to have a situation where we can write the services in any language. So not only do we need to use a transport mechanism or a communication mechanism that's language independent, but the program has to be lenient of the incoming data. And by leniency, I mean leniency at every level. So if a method expects four arguments and it only gets three, it should deal with it. Arguments come, you don't check arguments as part of the protocol, like this is back to a SOAP issue. Instead, you're using JSON here, right? You have as many arguments as you have. <laughs> But that's a good thing. It gives us more flexibility. But that means that an argument inside the system might be passed around in a, in a hash table, <laughs> right? Not as a set of four variables, not as a struct. Because we might not know how many arguments we have. If things are misspelled, deal with it. You want to be as lenient as possible. Mm -hmm. Uh, say again. So if you was if you were talking about language independence mm -hmm. and you're talking about ASCII, that pretty much limits you to Roman Romanic languages. It is. And the the if you look at the underlying messaging systems though, those are all ASCII systems. And the problem is that once you get out of once you get into Unicode or something like that, it's a huge can of worms with respect to trying to determine meaning when you get a request coming in. Now, that doesn't mean you can't use Unicode. What it means is that you need to encode it in the same way you would encode a Unicode string if you were making an HTTP request. In other words, it's got to go down to ASCII, and then you can rebuild the Unicode from whatever you're using to transmit it. But the trans I'm talking about the transport level at the transport level here. It's got to be ASCII. So the advantage of going to ASCII at the transport level is that you don't have to use Unicode. If you want to use a multi-byte character set or something like that, you have the option. You just need to encode it in a way that you can decode it on the other side. What you don't want to be doing, though, is transmitting 16-bit glyphs or 32-bit glyphs or multi-byte sequences. Right? It all should be coming across a straight 8-bit ASCII. Just on the lenient, mm -hmm. uh, and I get what you're saying about being lenient, but I'm not quite sure. Like, so if, for example, you get a larger int than you were expecting, when mm -hmm. you say deal with it, what exactly do you mean by that? I mean that you should, um, well, there's lots of ways you could deal with it, right? One of them is that if the number is this large, there's something wrong. The service is not designed to do this, in which case the dealing with it would just be producing an error. But the other way of dealing with it might be that you use a big int instead of an int in the code, right? Yeah. <laughs> you, can't, you can't make any assumptions about the sizes of things, so if something comes in too big, you've got to fall back to a different type than would be your, your preferential type. Right? So it's going to depend on the situation. It's going to depend on the API definition. Right? It's perfectly reasonable, as far as I'm concerned, to say in the API, this number must be in the range x to y. Right, but the, if you don't say that in the API definition, then you've got to deal with whatever you've got. Right, so it's up to you to make the contract be the contract that you want. 
Mm -hmm. What's the best way to handle changes in that interface? Is it to have version interfaces or is it to have it so they're backwards compatible or what's the best practice? There? Well, you can always deploy uh, two instances of the service that have slightly different interfaces. Mm -hmm. Right? And they would use, you'd solve that problem by giving them different message IDs or something, you know, so, something that would, so it would route to the right one. And if it's always possible to have two protocols, if you will, for the same service running on the bus at the same time mm -hmm. indefinitely, if you want to do that. Yeah, just what they're listening to. Yeah. Um, argument ordering shouldn't matter, right? Because it varies from language to language. We shouldn't care. Of course, if we're using JSON again, we've solved that problem because it doesn't, it doesn't matter anymore. In other words, all of this stuff that SOAP is helping us with, we don't want it, right? Number formats, commas, decimal points, make it work. You know, it's, the, the, um, it's not hard to do, but we have to do it. All this stuff. Oops. Locale shouldn't matter, precision shouldn't matter, so on and so forth. Um, distributable, well, the service should be able to run um, pretty much anywhere. And the, the um, advantage of that, of course, is that if the service can run in process, then you can test in a single process. If the services can all run on the same machine, then you can test on one machine. But you ought to be able to go from your test environment to your runtime environment without any pain. <laughs> So if the service is designed to both run on the same machine and not on the same machine, then you can deploy simply by changing an IP address and you're done. And of course, it should all work across the internet too. We may distribute our services across multiple data centers. So there's a security issue there. Um, the topology can change as the system is executing. And that's something you have to deal with. Most messaging buses handle that pretty, pretty well. And then finally, we have monitor, monitorability issues as we talked about those. Three right? topology. Hmm? Three topology. You said distributed topology might change. Yeah. Could you define that, please? Um, the, we'll see some pictures of topologies in a moment. That'll probably be the best way to define it is to actually see it. But basically, it's the way in which things communicate with each other, the, the highway map <laughs> of, the, of the country, which is our service cluster. All right. So um, logging, we talked about logging. You've got to really get serious about logging. You notice that you want to log on the message bus because that means that you can have centralized logging services that are doing nothing but collecting logging messages that are coming from all of the services. But you also want to log locally in case something goes wrong with the bus. Right. So the local logs are going to run out of space after a while, but that's fine. Just throw away the oldest stuff if you have to. But um, you want to do both. You want all logging messages to go to both places. And you always need a ping or a heartbeat. All right? Questions about this before I now move on to the architecture? Mm -hmm. uh, how do containers fit into this web services work? Container in what sense? Well, you know, I don't use any container architecture at all in my systems. But in terms of microservices, it, would it be beneficial or...? I wouldn't use a container if I could avoid it. It'll, it'll add complexity. So I don't, I don't even use containers as simple as Tomcat. It's the, the, they're just adding complexity. They're making things hard to configure. I don't believe in configuration. It seems to me that if, if you have big configuration files, one of two things have happened. Um, the, first, the most likely thing is that the programmers are being lazy. They're saying, oh, I don't want to make this decision, so I'm going to make it a configuration option. And of course, what that does is it forces other programmers to make decisions that they're not competent to make. Right? <laughs> if you're building a service, you're the one who's competent to make that decision. So just make it.
Well, you can go either way. You know, I, you could go either way. I, it, the, the advantage of having it dying at the end of every service is that you get back to a known state, right? Um, but the dis obvious disadvantage is that you've got to go through the overhead of killing the process and launching it again, right? So I, I, would, I tend to want to keep the service alive if I can because I don't want that overhead. But it's, that's just a design decision is there's no correct answer there. Is the, the you know, go the, the go the way that works best for the application that you're working on. Okay. All right, now this is a slide that I pulled off of Gardner. Um, I want to talk about it a little bit, but I should say that I believe that this architecture is an incorrect one in many ways. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to show you the slide is because you're going to tend to get a big architecture like this in, from organizations that are used to big architectures like this. <laughs> and it, some of the stuff here, right, this, all of this stuff up at this layer, including the load balancing layer here, I think this is all almost completely unnecessary. Um, the vast majority of work is happening inside the microservices themselves as they communicate with each other. And most of these other layers I think we could get rid of. And the other thing I really dislike about this, well, I, I guess they're showing you going down to the messaging channel and then coming back up, and that's okay. But that's the only way I do it. I never have situations where I have things up here uh, feeding into the microservice by some interface that's not the messaging interface. So I, I use more of an adapter strategy. There is always messaging inside microservices, however. And there's always a layer underneath of things like the monitors and so forth. Now, they're not showing those as tied into the messaging channel, but they will be. Everything has to be tied into the messaging channel. Um, the other issue that's important, though, what the, the thing that actually this article that I stole this picture from was trying to make is this pink inner architecture thing, is that in microservices, in the inner architecture is everything. Is that all this stuff on the outside you do, kind of don't really care about. It just has to do with ops. And the microservice that's, a microservice that's built correctly should be built in such a way that we can change all this stuff out here and it won't impact as much. So Gardner is focusing on all the ops stuff because their clients are giant corporations who have a lot of money invested in all of this ops stuff, and they don't want to be told that they didn't have to actually invest that money after all, and that we can do it in a much simpler way with a much simpler setup. So they're, not, they're not going to be happy, right? Somebody's going to lose his job over that. So <laughs> they're going to want to try and force a microservice architecture into something that's more complicated than it needs to be. So that's something to bear in mind as we start deploying this stuff. Now, it's all based on messaging. Everything here is based on messaging technology. So messaging has been around for years, is that I used messaging in the first system I wrote when I first got out of school. And that system was an embedded system inside a robot that was using messaging for, uh, basically, we had separate little boards attached to each of the components of the robot, the motors and the sensors and so forth. And we had a message bus that was being used by those components to communicate with each other. Right, this stuff has been going on for an awfully long time. But for some reason, it kind of fell out of popularity, is that for years, nobody knew what messaging even was, unless you were working for a giant corporation, in which case you thought of it as middleware. Right? <laughs> and middleware was nothing but a message bus that programs that were written to not talk to each other could use to talk to each other. <laughs> Right? In other words, the point of middleware is that you had one message bus in the middle, but you had a bunch of so-called adapters that would translate whatever weird thing the program wanted into some common lingo that you could use to talk to other things on the same bus. Well, that's one use of messaging. But the lighter weight uses of mes messaging are much more interesting. And they've been around. If you look at Java, for example, JMS has been part of Java since day one. But people have not used it for some reason. In the Microsoft world, we have to use it. Or not Microsoft, I'm saying it again. Microservices world, we have to use it. <laughs> In the microservices world, we have to use it. So this is all based on messaging. Now, let's look at a couple of topologies, to use the word that I was using earlier, a couple of ways that messaging can be used to make things work. Now, I've, I've shown you two messages buses, buses here, this red one and this blue one. A message bus might not have any physical existence. This is a, a conceptual concept. Conceptual concept. This is a concept <laughs> that we use to kind of organize things in our heads. 
it turns out that this message bus doesn't actually exist as a thing. That's just a concept. I publish, in other words, the concept is I publish to the bus and I subscribe to a, to a notification on the bus. But in fact, you can do this in a point-to-point -point way. If you're using 0MQ, you will do it in a point-to-point -point way without some kind of central manager sitting here. They call these brokers and messaging systems. The blue bus, it turns out, is actually a small application, a small service, which is receiving messages and then sending them out again. So everyone following me here? Or to put it another way, this is just a convenient way to think about routing. <laughs> this, on the other hand, is actually a program. Right? So when I publish, I'll push to this bus, what that means is I'm going to push it into some broker, and I, which is going to maintain a queue. And when I pull from this bus, what that means is that I'm going to pull from some broker, some program that was maintaining the queue. So somewhere there's got to be a little program here that's maintaining the queue. So everyone following what I'm trying to say here? Now, it's not worth drawing that here. It's just going to clutter up the diagram. So when you see these diagrams and you see buses, they might be programs, they might not be. OK? This bullet shouldn't be here yet. It'll make sense in a moment. <laughs> I don't have my builds quite right. Um, this basic structure, though, is an important one. Now, this is the structure that's used by the web server that I use, which is uh, Mongrel 2. Um, if anybody's used Mongrel, Mongrel is, is the Ruby web server. And it's a, a good, fully, func fully functional, high volume web server that's very, very fast. Now, I'm not programming in Ruby, though. And in fact, the guy who wrote Mongrel isn't programming in Ruby anymore either. So Mongrel, re two, Mongrel, Mongrel 2 is actually a complete rewrite. The only reason he called it Mongrel is because he had written Mongrel 1 and he liked the name. Um, it did use some of the code, though, is that the HTTP parsing part of Mongrel is in Mongrel 2. So he took that code and reused it, uh, which is a good thing, actually, because that's good, solid, tested code. However, Mongrel 2 is a very different beast than the original Mongrel. Now, what I've called the portal here is a Mongrel service instance. What Mongrel does is that at one end, it, it acts as an HTTP server. It gets requests. Now, you don't use any kind of plugin. You don't do much configuration. It's a very, very lightweight thing. So you can get Mongrel up and running in about two minutes. You download it, you compile it, and you launch it. There's a configuration file that's going to be about four lines long. And what that configuration file says is, when I receive a URL that looks like this, I'm going to create a message and put it on a specific message bus. So Mongrel is, this portal is tightly integrated with the 0MQ messaging system. Is that they have changed the whole notion, in other words, of, of servicing web requests into a microservice friendly notion. Is that every request comes in here as a request and it immediately goes out onto a messaging bus as a message that is carrying a JSON protocol that specifies in it all of the arguments specified in the URL and in the post data. Comes in as JSON. And that can be handled by any service out here, written in any language, running as a standalone process. So you don't plug anything into Mongrel. What you do is create a service that binds to a specific address. Right? This service is at this TCP address. And then you say to Mongrel, when something comes into this URL, publish to that address. Everyone following what I'm saying here? It's a really nice architecture. So you could build something like this yourself. You could build a, portable, a portal that ran inside IIS, or you could build a portal that ran inside of, of Apache or something, but why bother? <laughs> For one thing, I don't want to carry around all of the weight of something like Apache when all I'm doing is this simple thing. M-O-N-G-R-E-L. Mongrel, or did I, okay. The, the, I thought I had it written up here, but I, I don't. It'll, it'll be written at some point. Okay, now, the other thing to notice here in terms of the sort of basic topology is that we're using different kinds of messaging depending on where we are in the, in the request handling process. Is that Mongrel pushes to the service. 
or more to the point, it pushes to a broker and then the service pulls. But the basic idea is that you get a request and you push it out to a service. Now, if there are multiple services, we'll look at this in a minute, they will round robin. So if there are four requests coming in very quickly and four services, each service will get one of the requests, four identical services. Each one will get those identical requests. The response is done using a publish subscribe mechanism. So one of the things that the message carries with it is a unique ID for this portal. And that ID is used as the topic that you're subscribing to. I'll, I'll come to it in a second, okay? So let's, let's build this out a little bit more. I might at some point have enough load on the front end that I want to add a second portal. So in this situation, I've added a second portal, but there's still only one service running here. So the advantage of the pub sub on the return is that if I put the ID of the portal into the, as the topic, this guy will subscribe to responses for requests that it generated and this guy will subscribe to process the requests that it's generated, and this guy doesn't care. Because it's just taking the topic that is passed in in the message and using that to send the reply. So I can layer up as many portals as I want here, and the service does not know that. It can be, in other words, it can be handling multiple requests from multiple portals. Is this making sense? It's an important issue in terms of scalability. Now, if I do this, of course, I'm going to need a little bit of hardware load balancing out here. I'm not showing that in the slide yet, but I'll, I'll need a little bit of hardware load balancing. Now, the next step, though, is that, um, well, there's my hardware load balancing. I am showing it. Um, the next step, though, is that I could then spawn off multiple services. In other words, I'm monitoring the world as the world is working, and what happens is I notice that my service up here is overloaded. It's, it, the, the, the input queues are just getting too big, is that it's, it can't work. So I can just clone off the service and run a couple more instances of it. Now because they're on the same logical bus here, when you push, it will round robin to the three services as the requests come in. So all of a sudden I have instantly and dynamically load balanced. So by using this architecture, we have the ability to add additional portals if there's so much incoming HTTP traffic that we can't handle it, and at the same time, spawning off clones of the services if there's so much backend activity that we can't handle it, and do that completely painlessly without anybody having to know that we've added extra stuff. Right? See what I'm saying? The portals don't know how many things are over here, and the things that are over here don't know how many portals there are. This is a really nice decoupling. Can I ask you something? Mm -hmm. So right. We go to the top, middle, bottom, right. Um, regardless of what's busy at the time, whereas it's that's correct. It, so that's correct. It's not based on load. It's just okay. it's just dumb. So even if they were unloaded, and it would always go that the first message came in, the top one would process it. That's correct. When the next one came in, even if the top one was available, the middle service. That's would correct. Process that message. That's correct. So it's, it's always going to distribute amongst the three of them evenly, okay. and it does what's called fair queuing, which basically says that things that get distributed evenly. then it's going to be pending in its input queue. Okay. It pulls when it's ready. Right, they all pull when they're ready. So there has to be some kind of queuing buffer at the, at the front end here. Um, our, goal is to keep, our goal is to not enqueue things. Our goal is to make the queue sizes as small as possible. No, interestingly, well, it depends on the messaging system. In Zero, interestingly, not. Um, Zero manages to be brokerless while at the same time being reliable, <laughs> which is an interesting feat. So if this guy goes down, what will happen is that the things that were in its queue will end up getting redistributed to the other ones, which is pretty nice. But if it doesn't go down, if it just gets stuck in a particular process, would it continue to continue the queue? If it just gets stuck, its queue is going to continue to fill. Okay and eventually it will get full, <laughs> and it, which will cause it to start rejecting requests. And of course a monitor could detect that situation and try and deal with it. Okay? 
So this is my basic architecture for um, web applications. Is, is the, the um, oops, push one more in, right? Is we can have a logging service here too. Mm -hmm. So going back to my asynchronous problem, mm -hmm. for example, like, let's say you're creating an account on the website, you can't log in until that account has been created. Mm -hmm. So how do you get that published information back to the client? You go back to the portal. That's happening at the portal, right? So the portal, HTTP comes in and it's now sitting on that request. So that's called that like a web server. It's like a web server. It's like a little yeah, miniature web server. server. Right, but the thing is, is that if, if you think of the, if, if we were to implement this in servlets or services or something, what would happen is that service would be sitting there waiting for the, for the message that it has subscribed to to arrive. And when it arrives, it would then generate the HTTP response and send it back. Right, in other words, the request comes in, it pushes out to the messaging system, after, and then it subscribes, and it sits there waiting for, this, for the thing that it subscribed to to come back. Could it also, could it also maybe call another service if it was required? It, absolutely, it could. Absolutely, it could. But it should be doing it across the bus. It shouldn't be, yeah. right? Everything should be on the bus. Well, I was just thinking something like, we've received your request. Please watch this video while we're building your account. And then well, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, we won't, hopefully we won't have to do that, but yes. <laughs> But it, it is synchronous from the, from the perspective of this client, yeah. right? Because there's a request and a response. And the response won't happen until you make this loop. Okay. Right, so this guy is synchronously hung. It's suspended here, waiting for a message to, the message that it's subscribed to, to arrive. Right, is, is everyone getting how this is working? But what's happening out here, who knows, right, is that the services could be talking to each other, they could be just a simple service, who knows what's happening. Right, now notice again how logging is just, yet an, is just another service on the same buses. So it subscribes to everything on this bus and just, just makes a record of it. And then over here, remember this is a program. <laughs> so what this program does is it pushes everything to the log as it comes in. So it's really easy then to just put a log in, and now we can monitor all of the bus activity without having to work very hard at it. Now, of course, we can have multiple services, in which case we basically have to have multiple push buses in order to make that work. As with the picture before, we were looking at several clones of the same service, so they were on the same bus. If we have multiple services, they're going to sit on different buses, right? Because remember, we round robin. I'm going to round robin between these, these two things as requests come in. That's implying that the request could be handled by either thing, which is implying they're the same service. Right? So we have to have multiple little buses here if we have different services. And what, what the configuration for, for Mongrel will do is um, that routing for us, because that's what we do in the configuration file, is we say when a particular request comes in, route it to this bus. And the bus is identified by a TCP address. So it's all, everything looks like addresses. Now, notice, however, that they're all, re oops, notice, however, that they are all responding to this on the same pub sub bus because we can differentiate by topic at that level. So we don't need separate buses. And then, of course, we could have multiple <coughs> portals talking to multiple buses all at the same time. <coughs> It looks complicated in the picture. In practice, it's not. Right? Because these two, these two guys are just exact clones of each other, using the same configuration file. Now, we also can use messaging to handle failures and filtering. So it's often that you will have services that are doing nothing but filtering an incoming request and then passing it off to another service for further processing. So here I have a situation where I have a filtering service here. The portal is pushing to the filtering service. And then it will say, let's say the filtering service is doing some kind of authentication. This is the, trying to figure out that this is the person who says that who, who they are who they say they are. And if it turns out the authentication doesn't work, it fails. 
in which case it just publishes that failure up to the bus, which comes back around to the portal who then deals with it. If it doesn't fail, then it pushes further into the system that we were just describing. So this is again done topologically though. By topology now, what I mean is the organization of these services with respect to the various message buses that they're using to communicate with each other. So in a way, when we're talking about microservice architecture, it's all about topology. Is that writing the individual services is easy. <laughs> right? what we have to be, and you end up drawing a lot of these little pictures <laughs> just to try and figure out who talks to whom and, and why. We can also make service-to-service -service requests. So here the, authentica the, the authentication service the, the, here might be talking to a user management service down here. In other words, the way the authentication service works is, is he, he passes a message down here saying, is this guy who he says it is? In other words, does this username attach correctly to this token? <laughs> Remember, we're not going to get the token. We don't need to use gets and sets. So the message request here is going to be verify this for me. Verify that this is a legitimate token for this user. And the response is going to be, yes, it's legitimate. That goes onto the bus. But now the subscriber is the filter, not the portal. So again, that's done all by topics. So the buses, the services can talk to each other using the same architecture than they would use otherwise, use if they weren't talking to each other. And then, excuse this, but I thought about this last night while I was sitting in my hotel room and I had primitive drawing tools. But the, the <laughs> as I said, we professionals, we work on things at the absolute last minute. <laughs> the, <laughs> um, Putting this in the, I wanted to put this in the context of how 0MQ actually implements it, though, just for those of you that know 0MQ so that you can see this. But also I wanted to talk about heartbeats. So here we have our portal, which has a push socket that matches a pull socket. This thing is the bus that we've been looking at, is that blue bus we've been looking at. And what it does is it pull, typically it pulls and then pushes again immediately down to the service. So this horizontal line on the previous picture was the, or this vertical line on the previous picture was the horizontal line across to the service. And the blue bar that was the message bus is actually this little program here. But the point I'm trying to make here is that this is a program. <laughs> so it can publish to a bus and publish its own logs and its own heartbeat to that bus. Am I being clear here? And that bus is being used to service this guy, but it's also being used to serve a load manager, something that's keeping track of system health. This making sense, everyone? The service itself can do logging and heartbeat on the same bus that the bus is using. <laughs> so this is an ancillary bus that didn't appear in that earlier picture. This is, this is a bus that's being used strictly for heartbeat and log messages. So it's useful sometimes to think about this in a decomposed kind of way. Not, don't try and draw one picture that represents the whole system because then you end up with something that looks like a plate of spaghetti. Right? <laughs> if you decompose it into several, several, several separate pictures, it's often useful. So... We're not going to have a whole lot of time. Actually, we're, we're out of time at this point. What I was going to do next is I was going to actually get into the blogging stuff, but we never, we never quite got there. So I will apologize for that, is that we can, we can look at that offline. But this is the important stuff. The rest of it was just a simple implementation of the blogging stuff. So I just, let, let me just go quickly to the point, points that matter. Um, everything is done with JSON. So here is the JSON that I cared about. There's a request, a chunk of request JSON here that carries with it an authentication token and some name for the request and the arguments, which as you can see here, are just passed as an array of key value pairs. This is just a hash map. So ordering doesn't matter here. Everything is strings, so I'm not tied into a specific way of representing numbers and so on and so forth. The response comes back with a simple status, which is either okay or fail. 
And then the result here is just whatever the service res responds with. I don't even know. It's just an object of some sort. The post request that's coming in has a bunch of interesting stuff in it, but the important thing is that there's going to be some kind of identifier that identifies where the post is coming <coughs> from. So th this is a post in the sense of a post to the blog, right? not in an HTTP sense. Right? So I have an ID for the post itself, so I know what, what, what blog is being posted. There's some blurb associated with the blog post. There's a date associated with it. It's got arbitrary content. And then notice that I'm carrying the comments along as part of the blog post here rather than separating them out. It just was convenient because there weren't that many of them. There's only a half a dozen or a dozen comments on a, on a given blog post that just wasn't worth the trouble to separate it out into a separate object, if you will. All right, is this making sense to everyone? So that's the, that's the JSON piece. Um, I'm using a kind of stripped down UML diagram here to show you the services because they look like objects. We might as well use UML. It's as good as anything else. And the, so the blog, for example, service has th four methods that let you get a list of posts out based on some kind of certain criteria. You say to it, I want you to add a comment to this post for me, and it deals with it. I'm not getting it out and then putting in a new one. I'm just adding. And then you can give a thumbs up or a thumbs down to a specific comment by asking the service. Now, originally I had thumbs up and thumbs down as a separate service, and that's maybe not a bad idea. Um, there's always a tension here <laughs> between big versus, versus uh, tightly focused. Right? Big is easier to implement. Tightly focused is obviously better from a flexibility point of view. Um, there's a user and there's an account. The user keeps track of a login and logout information. Um, we're not seeing the service that would be used to create the account, but that's, or we're not seeing it connected, but that's the separate create account service down here. Um, the way that I did it is that when the user is typing in the, pass, the password and username and so forth that they want, um, what it's doing is it's reserving it at first so that I can display it in red if somebody already has the username and then turn that to green when the, when the username is unique. And then you can set the password for the previously reserved username here. See what I'm saying? In other words, this guy returns a chit, and then the chit comes back around. So this is, this is client-side state that I'm using here. And then there's a forgot password mechanism. And the way that I did the forgot password system is that I decided I didn't want to deal with it. I was just going to defer the issue entirely. So when I say I forgot the password and here's my username, what it returns is a whole big chunk of HTML that will be the, the entire forgot password dialog. <laughs> and that way I can not worry about forgotten passwords for the moment. <laughs> right? I might change my mind about that later on. And then there's a change password and a delete and logout. So when you set up an account, you'll be talking to this service. When you're authenticating, you're going to be talking to this service. All right, is everyone following me here? When you log into the system, you get an authorization token back for the current session. When you log out, that basically kills the token. But when the authentication service is just going to call is valid here, saying here's an auth token, is this legit? Right now, I'm being a little loose here. I could also pass in the username. I could, if I wanted to be really hardcore, I could have a system where every request would replace the token with a different token. <laughs> and I'm not doing any of that, but I could add that easily enough if I needed to, because it's all in the context of one service. All right, is it, this making sense? So these, service, oops, these services are all just sitting on that message bus that we were looking at a moment ago. They're communicating, each, 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 uh, communicating with each other using those JSON packets that we were looking at a moment ago. And that's pretty much the whole system. They're all little standalone independent things, which I can work on completely independently. They, can be, they, they don't happen to be written in different languages now, but they could be. I've got them all written in Scala right now, but they don't have to be. Um, so it's a little service. And I have a total of four small services here. All right, so everyone follow. Oh, I didn't mention the filter. The authenticator filter is the one that we were looking at a slide of mo at a moment ago, right? So all requests go through the authenticator filter, which is what's making this is valid 
call to the user service. So here's one service talking to another <coughs> service. And if it goes through the authenticator, then it goes to the blog service. All right, questions? Um, sorry, on the user service and the account service, mm -hmm. can you talk to a shared database or? No, is that the, the user service has a, uh, has a um, database in it. And when the user service needs to talk to the account service, it does it through the API. It doesn't do it by sharing the database. Right? That way they can have completely separate databases, but they can get information back and forth. When they talk to that, each other, do they do that by the bus? Or they do that by the bus. Yeah. Everything is done by the bus. Even inside the program, I do everything by the bus. Um, one of the things I like about Zero is it has an extremely lightweight and fast um, in-process bus implementation. So you could, and the way that you do it in process versus not is you just use a different protocol when you specify the URL. It's just IPC colon instead of TCP colon. So, um, sorry. So um, back to the whole um, being um, self-contained. Mm -hmm. The bus is protected by the mongrel instances, yes. Okay. Right, so the, there is SSL to there. Those are all HTTPS requests. Okay. Once I'm on the bus, then everything is encrypted at the messaging level. So there is a point of vulnerability in the portal because as things are going to be in the plain text in the portal as you go from one system to the other. How does the service know what methods are being called again? It's just specified as a string in the JSON that comes in, in the request string. It's a kind of poor man's RPC system. Okay, well, I'll, I will let everybody go get coffee then, but I'll stay here so you can keep asking questions if you want to. So thank you very much for coming. Um, let me start by talking about software as a service because that's, people often confuse the notions of software as a service with the notions of microservices. Um, the, the SOS model is one that has been around for a long time, but it is not micro in any sense of the word. That's the main difference, is most of the SOS applications were just big, giant applications. They tended to have REST front ends. They tended to be hosted on a single web server um, they tended to be, um, well, monolithic is the word that I've used here, but uh, monolithic in the sense that they were just one big application. So from an architectural point of view, software as a service is not a particularly interesting model. It's just a big app that's got a REST front end in front of it running on a web server. Microservices are nothing like that. Um, the, Oh, the other one, the last one I'll put in there is they tend to access the data only. I'll come back to that in a second. But if you think about it, they're RESTful. And if you're doing REST, that means that you've got four verbs and you're using those four verbs to access resources, right? Well, what you end up with then is that your software as a service model more often than not turned into nothing but a front end in front of the database. And a microservice is not doing that. Microservices are actually doing work. So the microservices, on the other hand, are very small. Um, the, they, um, by very small, I mean they could be anything in the range of a few lines of code to maybe a few thousand lines of code, but they're not going to be an entire application. Um, I'll get into this more in a moment, but if you think about object modeling, about breaking up a program into a set of objects that implement some well-defined class with the objects talking to each other using messaging, right? We've all heard that word, using messaging. The problem is, is that we've come to interpret that word using messaging as mean, meaning making function calls, right? A microservice architecture is really nothing but that, except we're actually using real messaging. So if you think of a microservice as being a class, that's actually a better way to think of it than thinking of it as an application that's running on a, on a server somewhere, on a computer somewhere. It's really a standalone class. And as we'll see in a minute, you, de you design them the same way you would design standalone classes. So they're small, they're self-contained, 
They hide things, right? One of the characteristics of an object that's an extremely important object is that an object, if it's done right, will hide the implementation details. Um, I have a rule of thumb that you should be able to completely replace the implementation of an object with a different implementation, and the clients of that object shouldn't know. That, that rule applies in spades to microservices. So microservices will typically have their own databases, but more importantly, they will not expose any information about how they're accessing that database to the outside world. They tend to not, in other words, provide data. Now, they will provide some data, is that these are web applications we're building, so you need to move data down to the web, to the browser in order to be able to, to um, do anything, in order to, to expose a user interface. But more often than not, you'll follow this another basic object-oriented rule, which is that you don't ask for information, you ask for help is that you don't ask for the data that you need to do work, you ask the thing that has the data to do the work for you. And that's really at the core of the microservice model. This notion of having a remote entity that does work for us, rather than provide us with data that we need to do the work. So because of that, that tends to reduce the size of the client side piece because it's not doing as much work as it used to be doing, and that's a good thing, of course, is that means that the client side piece can focus on the user interface rather than on the underlying logic. Now, Conway's law keeps coming up in the context of the microservices, and I think it's worth thinking about. The basic notion, of, again, of Conway's law, which you've probably heard six times by now, is the correlation between the structure of the organization and the structure of the software that the organization produces. And a lot of that has to do with organizing things into silos with inside the organization. In other words, when you have a silo-like organization, you end up with a silo-like application. So uh, the whole notion of a three-tiered or n-tiered architecture is really dependent, or not dependent, but connected to the way that the organization is put together. Now, when we go into the agile world, we go into multifunctional teams, where we have three teams that, represent, that have represented upon them all of the skills that one needs to do the application. So given that kind of organization, that gives us a lot more flexibility in terms of how we build things, is that you end up now with small microservices that are self-contained. The team could build a single microservice without talking to anybody else. Now, it's not always the case, and in fact, it's not often the case that you'll have a direct team to microservice relationship, right? This team is responsible for this service. Because in an agile world, at least, the unit of work is a story not a piece of technology. So in the process of implementing a story, you're gonna to have to go in and tweak three or four little microservices. But the point is, is that because of this team structure, that's not only possible, it's easy. So one of the reasons I wanna bring, I wanna bring this up for two reasons, is that one is that this Microsoft model then, or Microsoft, this microservice model, becomes a very um, distributed kind of model where each of the services is very well, is very self-contained, but more to the point, it contains all of the functionality that can be implemented by the people that are, we will certainly get to it, is that in the little blogging system that I've put together, I don't even use a database. It wasn't worth it. In other words, I'm doing a blogging system for myself to use on my own website. And my main goal was to have articles and comments attached to those articles. That's what I was trying to do. And I thought about that for a moment, and I thought, I'm going to produce, at best, two articles a month. So every year, I'm going to churn out a grand total of 24 articles. It is not worth messing around with a database to store 24 articles, believe me. I would much rather have 24 files sitting in, a, in the file system someplace. And by the same token, every article might have attached to it a dozen comments. It's not worth putting those in a database. Instead, I will just stick them in a file in JSON format. Right now, if I was going to scale the system up so that it was handling a massive number of blogs with a massive number of comments in it, well, I'm storing everything in JSON anyway, so I can just replace the file system with MongoDB and I'm up and running on a, with a real database. But I'm not going to do that first because there's no need to do that first. There's this agile philosophy that you implement in the simplest way possible for the situation at hand but you want to implement in such a way that you can expand it. Now, I followed that last rule by implementing around JSON. 
because that way I can do my flat file to Mongo translation in a few minutes <laughs> as compared to a few days or a few weeks of work. But the point is, is that the microservice architecture allows me to do that because nobody knows how a given service is storing the data or cares. So as a consequence, I can store the data any way that's convenient to me. If it's convenient to put it on the file system, I'll do that. If it starts being less convenient to do that, I'll change it to something else. Nobody will notice that that change has happened. Is everyone with me here? If you have a database access service, you don't have this luxury because there's, a lot of, there's going to be a lot of information in the APIs to that service that are making assumptions about the fact that there even is an underlying database and the way that database works. The other issue is transactional. We'll get back to transactions in a second also, but if I have an order object or if I have a blog object or if I have a comment object, any modification to that is going to be atomic with respect to the outside world. Add this comment. If, on the other hand, I have a database service, getting atomicity there, but turning things into transactions becomes very, very difficult, especially in a kind of flaky network kind of world where you have to be guaranteeing that all of the pieces of the transaction actually succeed before you will commit the transaction. If on the other hand I just say to a, to a comment manager, add this comment, I know that's atomic, even if it has to be done in multiple steps to the underlying database. So the notion of transactions helped, are helped a lot by working with this basic principle is that you're defining things by what it does, by, by being a, a domain level object not, a, not a, um, a technology or a piece of technology focused object. So when it comes to data then, you're just not thinking about it. Data is a non-issue. Database design is not a significant part of this process. There's nothing for a company-wide DBA to do here. So which gets us back to Conway's law, right, is that not only does the structure of the system reflect the structure of the organization, when you change the architecture of the systems that you're working on in significant ways, the structure of the organization has to change to adopt to that system's architecture. It goes both ways. So architectural changes of this magnitude are significant from an organizational point of view is that all of a sudden the central DBA or the office of the central DBA, if there is such a thing, is not going to have anything to do, is they're going to have to distribute knowledge out to the individual teams because it's the individual teams that are going to be doing the data access now, not, not the company as a whole. On the other hand, that makes our work a lot easier because I can mess around with my services little chunk of database and I just don't care about any, any of the other groups in the organization because they might not even be using the same database that I am. But there's no big monolithic database that somehow has to be managed across the whole enterprise in this kind of world. And from my point of view, that's a huge plus. So again, the rule that, I was, that, I, that came out a moment ago, asking the object to do the work for you, is we call this delegation in the object oriented world. But in the microservice world, it's essential. It's that uh, both from a transactional point of view and also from a, from a um, just getting work done point of view. Now, REST is the other thing that comes up in the context of microservices. And like data, you don't want to be doing REST either. And that's not to say that you don't want to be using HTTP, is that I'm fine with HTTP as a transport layer. But REST is a very specific thing. REST doesn't just mean you make a request across HTTP. What REST means is that your requests use verbs that are defined in the HTTP standard, get, put, post, the basic CRUD operations. And if you're doing REST properly, the way REST should work is that the URL should specify a resource and the verb, in other words, is it a post, is it a get, controls what you do with that resource. So REST is all about resource access. It's all about data, really. And we just saw that data is not really a central part of what a microservice is, that you're hiding the data. So a pure REST interface is of no value to us. And uh, so building a microservice across a REST framework, all you're doing is adding complexity to your system that you don't building it. So notice that each one of these microservices has its own database. There won't be a big, giant, monolithic database in a microservice system. Is that every object is responsible for maintaining its own state. It gets back to the whole basic notions of object-oriented design. So from my, from as far as I'm concerned, the difference between an object and a microservice is just a mechanical one of how do you send the messages. It's got nothing to do with, the, with differences in design particularly. So 
That gets us again to another basic OO concept, that the objects are defined by what they do, not by how they do it. So from a design point of view, you've got to be thinking in terms of designing that way. Those of you who are in my class on Monday, um, this is one of the main things that I teach to people when I come into a company as a consultant for a day of training, is I teach people how to start with a story and then end up with an architecture that directly reflects the abstractions in that story. And that's a, that's a very important thing to learn, is that there should be a direct correlation between the system that you're building and the objects that appear in your stories. So for example, if at the domain level, you have objects like customers and orders and line items, inside the program there will be classes like customers and orders and line items. There'll be a one-to-one -one correlation between the classes in your system and the main abstractions, if you will, at the domain level. From an agile point of view, that's essential because the changes happen at the domain level. And if there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the domain and the code, when a change happens in the domain, it's very easy to see exactly what you need to modify in the code in order to make that change real. If there's some system that has no direct co connection to the UI, for example, or no direct connection to, the, to any other part of the system, and there's an elaborate mapping, making those domain level changes becomes very, very difficult. Now, microservices follow the same kind of philosophy, is that you have to be mapping the individual services to domain level objects. So if you're doing an order processing system, odds are you're going to have an order service, and uh, perhaps even a line item service, an individual object service. You'll certainly have a customer service. You'll have an authentication service, right? So it's going to map to the domain. The services are going to map to the domain. Is everyone following what I'm saying here? So if you're thinking in terms of the service mapping to a specific piece of technology, as in the case of, uh, often I'll see people who do it wrong have a database access service. That's fundamentally incorrect. Is that you want to have domain level services that use whatever mechanism they need to use in order to do whatever they do. If that involves talking to a database, fine. If it doesn't involve talking to a database, fine. Right, now one of the things that we'll see in a moment, 